I'm Neva Goodwin, the co-director of the Global Development and Environment Institute. I'm delighted to have a chance to talk today with Mariana Mazzucato, who is one of the uh, winners of our Leontief Award for 2018. And we're very excited to have this chance to talk with her and hear some more of her ideas. Uh, Mariana is particularly well known for one of her books, which is called The Entrepreneurial State. And I would love to hear more about what you mean by that. Okay, so the subtitle of the book is Debunking Public Versus Private Sector Myths. And that's what I mean by that, <laughs> which is that we have both theories, stories, and discourses about what the public sector is for that are very problematic. Um, the one-liner might be that we think of the public sector as simply as sort of a lender of last resort, a facilitator, an enabler, when actually when it was the most successful at what it did from setting up the welfare state to funding some of the greatest technologies of our time, it was actually an investor of first resort, not a lender of last resort. And it absolutely was a co-creator and a co-shaper of markets, not just a fixer of markets. And so if you think of entrepreneurship as the willingness to take on risks and to create new markets, that's what I'm talking about. But because it's public and not private, what kind of markets are being produced, how they're being produced becomes incredibly important because we have to make sure that it's actually also producing public value, not just private value. Thank you. Uh, you refer to the need that to have an entrepreneurial state, particularly to address some of the grand challenges of our time. Right. So many of the technologies that are in all our smart products, from the internet to GPS, touchscreen display, and Siri, were actually spillovers from basically purely technological missions, like you know the Man on Moon mission. And first of all, that mission was very inspirational. And I think we should you know, retain that level of inspiration. But it was basically a technological one. Whereas the grand challenges that we have today from high levels and increasing levels of inequality to problems around healthcare systems to one of the greatest problems we have, which is climate change, these are problems that are not purely technological. They absolutely require technological change, but also social innovation, institutional innovation, regulatory innovation, political and policy process innovation. Uh, but let me just come back to the moon example, because what was interesting with that was that it was a mission that was addressing a challenge. The challenge at the time was the space race and Sputnik. Had the government just thought about this you know, generic problem of the space race, you know, would they have then had all these spillovers? No, by framing it as a mission, which was to go to the moon and back again safely within a generation, that then allowed very concrete targets to be set. It required many different sectors, and this is key, to innovate and to invest. So it was not just aeronautics, it was also clothing and textiles. You couldn't get to the moon in jeans and a t-shirt. Um, and lots of homework problems, You know, 200 or so projects that came from bottom-up initiatives. So those lessons of having kind of inspirational but concrete you know, targeted uh, missions which are addressing a wider challenge which require cross-sectoral investment. So you also help rebalance an economy. This is not just about defense. It's not just about high tech. Um, and then also how you create instruments that nurture bottom-up solutions. That model is incredibly relevant actually today for the grand challenges. What we shouldn't do is to think of it as a copy and paste. So as I've already said, the grand challenges are much more difficult. A very great book that I love is a short one by Dick Nelson, Richard Nelson from Columbia, called The Moon and the Ghetto. You know, just how much harder it is to solve the ghetto problem than it has been to get to the moon. And that is because it's a so-called wicked problem. It's a problem that has all sorts of social, political, and economic issues as well. But I think we can do it. And I just wrote a report for the European Commission on this, which is about mission-oriented innovation. And in order to illustrate the point, I take three challenges, one around getting our oceans clean, another one to set to you know, help solve climate change, to tackle climate change, and another one around health inequalities, and use those three challenges to think of different missions, and again, all the different cross-sectoral investments that one would need. So with the clean oceans one, it would be getting all the plastic out of the ocean that required in our um, set up of the problem about, again, 12 different sectors and lots of different projects, of which most will fail. 
and this is really important, how to get public institutions to also welcome uncertainty, welcome failure, but also learn from failure. And one of the biggest problems we have, I think, in 21st century capitalism is because we no longer really believe in the public sector. At best, we're trying to create an inefficient private sector in some of our public institutions. Um, then there has been a lack of investment in the capacity building and the capabilities within public institutions. There's a trend of outsourcing, not just privatization, actually outsourcing of the knowledge within public institutions. And this also makes it very hard for these institutions to A, welcome failure because they're told you know, that you will be on the front page of the paper and government failures are even worse than market failures, but also to learn from that trial and error process and how to get learning institutions, knowledge creating institutions within the public sector, which can both tackle the missions, come up with interesting models, but also set up these you know, bottom-up processes and learn from the trial and error process is incredibly difficult in, again, an era in which the structural capacity of these public organizations is really at threat. The uh, issue of governments being brave enough to fail is a very poignant one because there's so much anti-government feeling that any government failure is blown up and given a lot of big attention. In the challenges that you mention, some of them are social and economic, and the standard economist's response to those are growth. And then some of the challenges are environmental, like climate and oceans. And uh, some environmentalists see a real conflict in how to address environment and social needs because they see growth as the answer to the social needs and growth as the problem in the environment. Do you have any thoughts on how to address mm -hmm. that? So I think that the opportunity of having challenge-led growth strategies, and then more particularly mission-led growth strategies, mm -hmm. where those missions are public missions that produce public value, is that the conversation immediately becomes one that is more about the direction of growth rather than just its rate. Mm -hmm. And that whole issue of directionality, um, which is what kind of growth we want, sustainable growth, um, inclusive growth, and innovation-led, investment-led, not consumption-led growth. We mm -hmm. shouldn't forget that most, well, many countries like the UK and the US continue to grow in such a way that the levels of private debt to disposable incomes are back at record levels. That's consumption-led growth. To have a particular type of investment-led growth where that type of investment is in areas that might create more sustainable economies is absolutely what this kind of mission-led approach tries to do. What, what that then requires, though, is to have a more granular understanding of the kinds of jobs, the kinds of you know, also micro-level, city-level, local-level growth strategies we have. And what's interesting, again, learning from the past, is that when we had the mass production revolution, which is a huge technological revolution in terms of how we produced mm -hmm. uh, goods, um, and services, uh, there was also demand side policies that were fundamental to allowing that technological revolution to get fully deployed and fully diffused throughout the economy. And so my work with Carlota Perez actually has reflected on this and it was actually suburbanization, which came out of policy, which allowed mass production to get fully diffused. Hmm. And one of the opportunities today for green growth is to think of it not just in terms of, of renewable energy, but as a redirection for the whole economy and to provide a lens and a demand side lens, a demand side uh, force for the IT revolution to get fully deployed and fully diffused. And so again, by, by having a green direction, a sustainability direction for ICT in the same way that suburbanization played for mass production, that would allow us to um, have a particular type of growth, but also all sorts of new types of jobs that would actually increase the sustainability of the economy, for example, around maintenance, maintenance mm -hmm. jobs. Mm -hmm. When you have a limited market, which we no longer have with many people around the developing world actually coming out of poverty, uh, markets are actually expanding again, there's no reason to have people buy products that they have to throw out in you know, three to five years, which was actually a strategy that one had with limited markets. Mm -hmm. But if that's the case, if you want enduring products, which obviously would be good for the environment, you need lots of maintenance workers. And that would be a particular type of job 
strategy and skills and retraining programs that we would have. And this is why I sometimes become impatient with the people who uh, you know, just bang on so much about limits to growth is I think they're giving an excuse in some ways to policymakers to not really confront this issue about the direction of growth. By saying it's limits to growth, you immediately go back to a dichotomy of do we grow or do we not? Mm -hmm. And we know that if you don't grow, actually lots of people will be out of jobs. But how we construct the job strategy, how we direct growth in sustainable ways is, is potentially an incredibly exciting conversation to have and not to get lost in the dichotomous growth or no growth. Great. Um, you have talked, I'll ask you a quick question, about a market shaping and market creating strategy. Do you want to explain in just a moment what you mean sure. about that? So most uh, policy making in uh, the world at different levels gets framed in terms of fixing particular types of market failures, whether these are produced by positive externalities like clean air and basic research knowledge, or negative externalities like pollution. And that immediately frames the policymaker as someone who comes in with a bandage to fix something. Market creating and market shaping is a much more activist <laughs> uh, agenda, which is you are also a value creator. There's not just value creation in the private sector. You're co-creating value. You're co-creating wealth. And hence, also the discussions of how to distribute that wealth become much more activist. It's not just about taxing uh, wealth that's created somewhere. It's also about co-creating that wealth and then having a much more confident say on how it should be distributed. Well, you have a very persuasive case for a more activist and involved and effective government. And more power to you. Thank you very much. Thank you.